four courses that we provide uh, in, in collaboration with Easy Ways as our outreach program. So the first is already marked out. So if you missed that, it's not a big issue. It was all recorded similarly as um, it will be recorded for this week. So you can, if you like it, watch it again and again and again. And next week will be again uh, CNCC, a presentation about focusing on data analytics by Donatello and Fabrizio, Ophidia Advanced Concepts, Notebooks with Python Ophidia. And the week after is again DKZ with Paraview. And here we focus on advanced data relation, linking views. And um, when you signed up, you had also to specify what was your main interest. Is there any model that you used so far? And WAF came up a couple of times. And so there might be a small WAF section on how to get WAF data and process it and in, get into Paraview. OK, um, something for the organization that is similar to what um, Donatello has told you last week. Everyone who is not uh, the presenter, so either me or Florian, please turn off your microphone and switch off your webcam. The talk will be recorded and published later online. And if you don't want yourself to be recorded, then leave your camera and microphone, of course, always switched off. There's a Google document. Um, I think Florian sent around an email with that link. Um, and you can also find the very same presentation that I'm giving you right now in uh, the folder that um, Florian sent around. So in, if you have any questions, um, please best post them into this Google document both for the presentation right now, as well as when Florian is demonstrating Parview later on. And as you've also heard and read before, there's a virtual machi machine um, that um, Donatello created, and you can download that virtual machine. And on this virtual machine, you have um, all the necessary tools installed for Ophidia, as well as um, for Parview for running the one. But for Parview, what you can also do, you can just simply visit the website paraview.org and download the Paraview version that you need for your operating system, either Windows, uh, Macintosh, or Linux, and uh, yeah. Now some background information. What are we doing at DKRZ? So DKRZ is a German climate computing center, and we support uh, primarily the German climate research in um, community um, with uh, hardware and software and tools to support um, their climate research. So we have a big supercomputer at DKRZ uh, where you can run very large simulations, but also very small ones. And one group is focusing on data analysis and data visualization. And um, what we do is uh, in non-corona times, we have uh, workshops like the ones depicted in the image below where everyone is gathered around. And um, these usually last between two and five days. And our main tools that we work with are Paraview, MCL, and to some degree also Vapor. We've used other tools uh, in the past, such as Aviso. Um, that was a commercial product. But um, I think now we are only using free available tools. Some tutorials you can also see on the DKZ website. So just um, Google for visualization and DKZ, and then you'll find them. We are also um, in the midst of creating some online tutorials. And um, as said before, as part of Easy Ways, we have um, these um, dedicated data analytics and visualization workshop. Um, this is what we're having right now. So this is a screenshot of the website from DKLZ, where you see some information about Paraview. Um, there's a very old Paraview tutorial that I wrote, I think now six years ago already, focusing on working with climate and NetCDF data. While this version was focusing on PowerView 4. Point something, and now we are having 5.8, um, the majority of the techniques discussed in there are still applicable and can still be used. But we also have, um, thanks to Dela, a couple of online workshops, uh, online tutorials available on our website. Um, these will also be extended over time. So at DKZ, what are we focusing on? What is our main main work? What are we interested in to do? So we are looking to work with large data and small data. Um, but um, one thing that we are really interested in is the very large data, also because our climate scientists produce these large data, ranging up to hopefully soon one kilometer globally. And um, 
working with these data sets is not easy anymore because you have roughly 340 million cells for one 2D variable. And in 3D, I think it was accumulating to 30, between 30 and 40 billion cells for just one 3D variable in one time step. And what is not going well is um, the um, compute and storage capabilities of modern supercomputers. So one possibility to circumvent these problems is um, in situation with Paraview and Catalyst, but also compression and progressive data relation using wavelet decompositioning and compression and vapor. Um, we also regularly run the validation in batch mode on Mistral, where you just create a script with Paraview and then just let this um, submit this to the compute nodes and then the compute nodes generate the images and everything and so on. Due to these big data sets, we are of course also interested in compression, especially lossless compression, uh, lossy compression as it has always been done. So GRIP is one of um, a famous data format that is regularly used and it's slossy as well. But also when you decide what you want to save and at which time intervals you want to save the data, you actually actively apply lossy data compression. Then many models run also in, uh, in ensembles. And in these ensembles, um, you have um, certainty or uncertainty that needs to be visualized. How certain is um, a certain outcome of the model? Then as you are familiar, all these models generate tons of different variables. And you usually want to visualize them side by side without cluttering the screen while still creating meaningful visualizations. And here you have to ba balance um, art and um, uh, science a little bit, and it's difficult to specify the right color table and not to clutter the display with too much information in which um, an untrained user easily get lost. One thing that will become more and more important in our work, I think, is machine learning and online feature tracking, where ideally you would have an automatism that is running side by side with the simulation, and at the end, either tells the simulation expert whether or not the simulation went all right, or if there are some interesting features or artifacts um, somewhere in the data which desire the attention of the scientist. So why do we do this data visualization? Um, we're not doing the simulation because we can, but because we want to learn something from it. Um, a simulation that is just sitting on disk, but you cannot access the data anymore, is basically meaningless. So what we need is to see, understand, learn, and communicate. And that is also what we do. When we get access to new data, we try to see what is in there, visualize the different vari variables. Um, if you've extended the model and um, maybe added some additional processes or increased the resolution, then you would like to understand the correlations between a couple of variables then in the end, learn from that and also communicate these results to your scientists, to your fellow colleagues. And in relation, there are three um, relation goals that you that you want to do. So the first one is confirmatory relation. Um, you do this when you know um, a certain feature should be in the data, um, such as the AMOC in, in ocean data, then you're looking for this one. And if you find it, then you know the simulation is okay or plausible. Then exploratorization, when you would like to find new features um, that um, you would like to detect. This is um, the most interesting, but also the most difficult part of everything. And in the end, you would like to create animation and stills to communicate your results to your colleagues. So an example would, would be what you see below. Below is some um, uh, validation of liquid cloud water and cloud ice volume rendered using autographic projection. It's a cut through Germany. Um, on the left-hand side, you see the Alps. On the right-hand side, you see the, the Baltic Sea. And you see the transition um, from several cloud types into big cumulonimbus cloud type structures. This is a 2D visualization, um, a global 2D visualization, where you see vertically integrated cloud water and cloud ice. This is um, from an R2B10 simulation. So we have um, an approximate cell size of 2.5 kilometer. And uh, the data um, is really, really huge. And um, in 2D, this is still manageable. Visualizing this data in 3D is a little bit more difficult. 
And one benefit of um, working with climate data and visualizing it at the same time is that you often find yourself immersed in the beauty of the data. This is a close-up um, in um, the original resolution. And what you see is um, the Atlantic. On the lower left side, you see a little bit of South America. On the right-hand side, you see Africa. And you see all these little nifty, cute little clouds. Um, and um, if you're happening to look at the right um, time and animate it over time, then you see some thunderstorms over Africa that are evolving into big um, hurricanes over the Atlantic Ocean. Now we see a little bit of um, ocean data visualized. So this is um, the Icon ocean data at um, five kilometer resolution. Um, it's a cut in about uh, 70 meter depth. Um, so to just get um, get rid of um, the weather effects and the wind from the surface. And what you see is um, the horizontal velocity in the ocean and um, visualized on a logarithmic color table. And you see the, the Aguilla current, the Gulf current, and um, all these uh, little structures in the ocean. And with that data, you can further apply other techniques like um, extracting the gradient. In Paraview, you can also compute um, the vorticity and the divergence of a vector field. And um, by the way, all these uh, visualizations that I've shown you so far are done with Paraview, as most of our visualizations were. This is the same data. Um, here we see actually two different variables side by side without cluttering one, enable, uh, one another. You see um, the velocity still using this uh, bump mapping. This is a computer graphics technique where you just um, tilt the, the normal of um, the underlying surface so that you have these um, bumps in the data and you can very well depict the velocity. This is especially well shown for, for the Aguilla current, but also in the North Atlantic. And then color, it's used for visualizing the salinity of the water. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, interesting to see is when you uh, visualize this data on a very big screen, it's actually a 4K simulation, a 4K visualization. Um, you can see some little data, a little um, water curling into the Mediterranean Sea. And um, yeah, because um, you don't have um, any other um, water flowing into the Mediterranean Sea, and so the water is um, evaporating. And that's why on the right hand side, um, you have um, this high levels of salinity. This is ocean data visualized on a sphere, so it's projected on a sphere. And what you see here is also a multivariate data visualization. You have um, both salinity and also, again, the velocity of um, the ocean currents but this time depicted using glyphs. The larger the glyph is, the uh, faster is um, the flow. And also this is mapped to, to the color of the glyph. And then you have um, a lick surface on the ground, uh, which also visualizes the global velocity field and the color of the velocity field, um, the shading, different shadings of blue that depict um, the salinity. So the brighter it is, the more salty the water is. Um, this is um, the Spielhaus production. Um, I've had this in there from, from another presentation. I ran around the Spielhaus present, uh, projection a couple of weeks back, and I was really fascinated by it and had to add it to our um, Icon reader into PowerView. The cool thing about the Spielhaus projection is that um, it is able to represent the um, ocean's body as one body of water without intersection or cutting and without very big distortion. Most of the projections that you see, um, either spherical or longitude latitude or Cassini or Mollweide, you see cuts in the ocean. Um, so you can't really watch it as a, as a whole. Uh, or you have very high distortions uh, in, in the projection. And here you can just um, watch it as, as one piece. This is unfortunately a photo. It's not a visualization by us yet. Um, this is a photo from NASA. And what you see are the Canary Islands and some typical clouds that you sometimes find behind islands. And actually, a um, couple of hundred years ago, when people were sailing on sea and looking for new land, they were looking into the sky for those types of clouds to find islands um, that may have not been discovered before because this is a Van Kamen vortex street, and this is um, 
a typical um, finding on, on and um, the Van Kármán vortex street is also a very interesting phenomena that um, people in fluid dynamics study. And the reason I'm showing you this is um, because we also found this in our data. So this is a simulation done using ICANN, uh, using 2.5 kilometer resolution. And what you see here is the 10 meter velocity field. So here is just um, the wind magnitude displayed. And then I played a little bit with the data. I computed um, the vorticity, um, the gradient. I even inserted a couple of particles to be advected into the flow. And also, all this has been done with PowerView. And um, now you can see where the particles accumulate. So sometimes they get um, trapped into um, vortices. This is um, the gradient magnitude of the flow. The Q criterion. The Q criterion can also directly be computed in PowerView. The Q criterion is um, a vortex classifier that is used in, in fluid dynamics. This is um, the divergence of the 10 meter vector field. I just um, go a little further. And then one, what you can do with um, video editing software is you can kind of um, cut everything side by side so that you do see the different quantities side by side and can compare them. Um, we're also very much interested in um, very high quality data visualization. And um, for the last couple of years, ray tracing is a really big thing. And um, for ray tracing in PowerView, you have uh, basically two choices. Um, the one that is shown here is um, Optics. This is um, the NVIDIA product. Um, you can use it um, free of charge. You just need um, one of these RTX um, graphics cards. And um, what uh, you see here is um, the Aguia current and the, the streamlines at different um, depths. And then you also see um, the surface that um, shows you the sea surface height. And you see um, how the water from the Indian Sea is um, kind of twirled around um, the Aguia current. And with ray tracing, you have also um, this um, depth of field, what you are familiar with from, from modern good cameras, where you can really focus on certain areas and direct the attention of your potential viewers. <clears throat> this is also a um, relation that was done with uh, ray tracing. But um, here I was using the um, Osprey ray tracing engine from Intel that is um, utilizing all CPU cores. So it's not needing a GPU, but a CPU. And what you see here is um, vertically integrated cloud water and cloud ice um, derived into one variable and then volume render it. Um, this is done using ray casting. Um, now we can also use uh, uh, path tracing, but ray casting is a little bit easier approach that is not as nice to, to render the clouds. And um, here I had to use a special transfer function that kind of uh, um, lets you see more small structure. We'll look at this later in, um, in two weeks in, um, in the presentation. Um, at the beginning of this year, we also made a, a big uh, relation movie um, for um, planetarium domes, focusing on one of um, the model setups that we are that we're using. It's uh, called Diamond Plus Plus, and it runs. Um, it's a coupled icon simulation between the ocean and the atmosphere. And what you see here is um, the um, Atlantic, and um, a large cloud band that is moving towards Europe and bringing, of course, a lot of rain to the British Isles and later also to Hamburg. And you see a cut through the clouds. And um, on the land, you see um, temperatures displayed. On the sea, salinity. And then you have a translucent layer that shows you um, the strong scale precipitation. And the clouds here, they are volume not also using ray tracing. But here, pass tracing has been used. Um, that uh, is able to depict the clouds a little bit more realistically. The strange curving of the screen is um, because it's a full dome video. Um, it's a VR video for um, that extends 180 degree around the viewer and um, is intended to be played um, in large planetarium domes. Or you can also watch it um, using one of these head-mounted displays. It's also very. 
and because we yeah one wasn't enough we actually made two relations um on the left hand side is uh, one that uses some um, normal OpenGL and constant elim elimination, direct elimination. And on the right hand side, um, there's a relation that is done with Authbrain. What you see here is um, the island of Borneo. And you see um, on the um, ocean's surface um, either temperature or salinity or now is, um, the wind velocity, and then also the clouds again. And um, what is um, visible that the clouds um, is are much more realistic here is displayed using Osprey, using shading. Also, this aids in the depth perception and the sense of time. But at the same time, the color tables are not as clear to, to see anymore as on the one with uh, direct illumination at OpenGL. So both approaches have their special uses and needs to be balanced in respect to the targeted audience and the visualization intent. So where you would like to show something and what you would like to explain. If you're interested, this video is um, available on YouTube and you can watch it from there. And then there's a discussion, why the heck do we need all these high resolution data? And um, yeah, so one idea is, um, or one, one, one answer is uh, that uh, not all processes can be explicitly resolved in lower resolutions. Clouds are one example. In low resolutions, clouds need to be approximated. While on finer resolutions, clouds can be explicitly resolved. And this allows, in turn, a much more precise um, forecast and um, prediction of um, the weather and the climate. And also, clouds play a huge role in climate uh, research and in global warming. And there are still, as I don't know, um, a couple of answers that are not, not there yet. Um, as a follow-up, this shows the relation of the so-called Diamond Initiative. This was a research project, I think, two years ago, where all major high-resolution models um, have been compared and have been run using the same initialization data. And one of these globes is a, a satellite image um, that um, shows the that a, a Japanese satellite image that is orbiting the Earth high above um, the Pacific Ocean. And um, the rest is um, the different models from all around the world, um, the, the States, uh, the NICAM in, in Japan, APESH in, in France, and so on. And they are all showing the data for 4 a.m. at um, August the 4th, 2016. And um, the researchers use this to kind of estimate the quality and accuracy of the different models. This is a very nice um, relation that um, shows you uh, the different models that we have with and without coupling at the different resolutions. On the top left, you see the five kilometer resolution atmosphere only. The one below is um, where this model is coupled together with the ocean. And on the right hand side, you see a finer resolution using 2.5 kilometer. And the projection that is shown here is um, more wider. That is also uh, projection that is commonly used. OK, um, where do we do all these? So um, we have um, a big supercomputer um, upstairs at DKRZ. And in this one, we have um, 21 GPU nodes. These are rather old. Um, so they have um, Haswell and Wardwell CPUs and Kepler and Maxwell GPUs, but still they perform very well with some um, data visualization um, and ray tracing works as well. Not the one from, from NVIDIA, but um, the one from, from Intel. And installed, we have software, NCL, Paraview, Vapor, IDL, Python, MATLAB, and so on. And we access these nodes using um, virtual GL and Turbo VNC. So all the data remains in the compute hall and we visualize our data remotely. This is an overview of um, the data that we have installed and that is available, and the ones in green that are available at DKZ. Now, a few slides of more technical things, um, just to, to round off the topic. Um, the PARA in PARAVIEW actually stands for parallel. Um, what you can do with very, very large data, you can start Paraview um, in a client server setting 
where you have um, a couple of data render servers and then just uh, one client connected to all of these and then also work with very large data sets. In the two images on the right, you see um, ocean data that I've loaded into Paraview using this parallel setting. And um, on the top slide, uh, top image, you see the data decompositioning um, that Paraview uses. So every one of these um, blue red color is rendered on a different node. In total, I think it was 16 different nodes. And um, on the image below, it is visible what is um, seen by the user. So to the user, it's just seamless, um, except that um, the work with the data is much faster. And for very large data visualization, um, there are two approaches. Um, I mentioned these ones before, we also work on those. Uh, and city visualization is um, the one on the left. Here, what you want to do is um, you would like to extract data and visualize your data while the simulation is still running and uh, on the supercomputer and in order to not save as much um, as before. And um, on the right hand side is um, progressive data visualization. So here what you do is after the simulation, you're not storing the data as raw net CDF, but you decompose the data into different level of detail. And later you can use um, an application such as Vapor to load this data and to render this data progressively. This is similar to what you're used to if uh, working with uh, JPEGs. Um, they use um, the same principle. So first a lower re resolution version is loaded and then you can work with this and then you can zoom in and um, some detail coefficients are loaded on demand. And this goes side by side with um, a change um, from post visualization to in situ. So post visualization is um, the thing that we all are used to and um, which works well if the data is small enough. But uh, when the data is getting bigger and bigger, it gets um, to be a, diff a problem because the storage is not um, coming after because um, it's uh, slower. And also um, it's difficult to analyze all the data while, while sitting on disk. The so postalization is you simulate all your data, then you store all your data, then in the end you read all the data back in, then you extract some information and render this. And this is an intermediate step. And the in situ version would be everything what you do uh, on the on the lower part on the main computer. So you simulate all your data in the supercomputer. Then while the data is still in main memory, you extract some information that you would like to have. And then you create an image and just store this image. This is what we've done with our Icon and Catalyst adapter. Um, Catalyst is a special version of PowerView, if you wish, which um, actually allows you to, to run in situ experiments. And this works as follow. You create a Python script with PowerView and which you would, in which you specify the visualization that you would like to have. For instance, uh, certain thresholds, um, extraction of ISO surface, duplication of a certain color table, even camera animation or some textual annotation can be done. Then from your Fortran icon model or any other model, you have to have um, a catalyst adapter that's able to transfer the data from a Fortran code to C++ code. And then in this C++ code, C++ catalyst code, this Python script is loaded and then you can render these images on, on disk. Um, you can perform some data reduction, for instance, applying a threshold. You can even perform a feature detection. You can also vis visualize the data live while it's on the same, uh, while it's still running. And you can also um, do some data decomposition. And this of course comes with advantages and drawbacks. Um, the big advantage is, is um, much less IO and simulation is actually faster because you need to store less data to disk and you get a preview of the data. You can also perform in situ feature tracking and you can even hook it up with some AI if you want. Uh, you can really do um, a lot of things, but the most biggest advantage is that you can also analyze extremely large simulation output. And in the end, the time to knowledge is shorter. The drawbacks is um, that you need additional resources, but as we've experimented so far um, with this, these additional resources are not that much. 
but you need a priori knowledge to design these um, Python scripts and to supply the thresholds and what you want to do. Biggest drawbacks of all is if your realization is not the one that, that you were hoping for, or if you wanted to extract a certain feature and you kind of miss it because you don't have, because you applied a wrong threshold, then you need to run the simulation realization again to perform a new in situ validation because all the data is gone and you only store either excerpts of the data or some images. The workflow complexity also increases and the analysis of the statistical data um, is a little bit more complex. Um, this is um, shown how you actually can supply uh, or generate these catalyst skip from within Paraview. Um, they had a complete overhaul uh, a couple of versions ago, and this is now very, very easy. Um, you can just specify it in the, in, in the user interface, which you use to render um, and uh, where to apply um, some thresholds. You can even have a couple of different ISO services for the data. Um, this is very convenient. This image doesn't look much, but it actually is. What you see here is um, two 3D variables <clears throat> that I can interact with easily on a normal GPU node, which would not have been the case if it was not um, kind of um, stored in situ. What you see here is um, in white is um, cloud water, and in um, the other, it was a little darker color, it's cloud ice, and at the 3D variable, um, and I applied um, a threshold operation to both 3D variables to just cancel out um, or stencil out the, the very, very, very small numbers that are actually non-clouds. And um, now with these reduced data, um, I can interact with both 3D variables at the same time interactively and explore them. This would not have been the case if I would just load the R2B10 3D raw data into Paraview. This is a cinema data table. Um, this is um, an image-based rendering approach that is also possible using Catalyst. And this one allows you to have a ton of pre-rendered images um, that can also be hooked up to a website. And the idea behind here is that um, this can be generated automatically um, while the simulation is running. And later when a simulation expert is looking for a certain certain data, let it be um, the transition from one cloud type to another cloud type, for instance, or for certain weather effects, then he just can go to, to this uh, website and look for the specific moment in time um, where, where this occurs and um, has the validation right there without the need to reload all the data that might have been stored to disk. I will skip over the implementation and um, the status for now um, and focus on this, I think, almost last slide of mine. Um, here you see the timings um, that were needed for this in situ relation. So you see it's a very high resolution 2.5 kilometer global simulation that was running on 540 nodes of Mistral. Um, the simulation wasn't really very long because we just want, wanted to figure out how long um, is the startup um, and the rendering of one time step and um, how much is in situ actually costing us. So in total, everything was running for, for six minutes. And um, you can see that um, the initialization of the model was uh, one minute and 11 seconds. The initialization of um, the in situ libraries was six seconds. Um, six seconds is quite a bit, but um, you only have to do this once. And then um, the three lines above, um, you have um, in situ set var, in situ do work, and in, in situ do work first. This in situ do work first is also once um, that has, be, has to be done once. Um, so it's 1.6 seconds, and all the other timings are actually neglectable. And the uh, version that we had run it here was for every ICON MPI process, we had one Catalyst MPI process, so there was a one-to-one -one communication. Okay, so now it's almost time for me to hand over to, to Florian. So he has supplied some information about um, 
where he has um, his tutorial data and also the data, but I think he sent out an email around this uh, as well. This is an important uh, site probably for some of you uh, where you get additional resources and additional information. There are a number of good tutorials um, out there on the internet. Uh, PowerView.org is a very good resource, but also um, the forum of PowerView, discoursepowerview.org. Um, this is uh, what I would also urge you if you run into any trouble with PowerView, um, either that it, you can't load certain data or that the relation is not looking as good as you want, um, this is a very good place to find help. Um, and also you can, can use um, the DKZ website with uh, tutorials that, that we supply. And um, yes, all this has been made possible because of um, the EU and the Easy Ways and Easy Ways 2 project. So what we're going to do is play a bit with Paraview in the virtual machine. So the thing that I would ask those who haven't done it so far to do is open the shell, go to desktop HPDA VIS training, Go to session two. Well, if you haven't done so, to run git pull. Then you should have a folder session two. You just go there and you run make. And that will open download files and open a Firefox. If you don't trust me to handle your virtual machine, just have a look at the make file and do the steps by yourself. Um, the other thing that you can then do is run Paraview by simply running Paraview in the shell. And then you get the Paraview window and it looks pretty empty at the start. Um, usually it doesn't come with a pink background, it just played a bit. And now you have this very plain window at the start. And what we're going to do is to load data. So I've provided example data, examples of ocean data, and we're going to get to the point where it looks like this. So you have the ocean currents in front of a background picture of Earth, and you can run that as an animation. And I just figured that the virtual machine doesn't really allow transparency for me. So we'll have to skip the transparent class for the moment. Um, maybe it works on a different operating system on the Mac, it doesn't. Um, but so when you start, you'll get a blank thingy. And I'll just move back to that. And all the steps that I'm doing are explained in this document that your browser will open. So, uh, so we start on this, we load the ocean, and we get an Earth, and we make things pretty. So the first thing you will have to do is actually go for the CDI reader. Um, so that's tools, manage plugins, Go for CDI reader and you make sure that it's loaded. So there's a load selected button down here and you can activate auto load here. And once you've done that, you can load data. So you go to the, the home of EDR, this training session two or folder and you load uv.nc. And I'll, I'll give all of you a bit of time to do these steps in a minute. I'll just briefly walk through the first few. So you load the CDI reader, and it tells you there's U and V, and you say, yeah, I want those. And you get an image of Earth. And if you click here in the top, you can, for example, select U, and you can already see the horizontal currents. So maybe I'll just let you guys do these steps first. So Start in the shell, go to the folder, 
in the desktop. Um, run git pull, go to the session two folder, run make. And maybe you can type a brief note in the chat once you've done that. So I know that this has worked so far. Yeah, you can also install PowerView locally. Um, that works. And then you can download the files from the link that Nicholas had in the document, and I'm going to find that in a minute. So what you can do once you have a data set in PowerView is you can shift it around a bit. So you can just take your mouse and you can move it to the side. Uh, you can use the middle mouse button for rotating it or you can use the right mouse button for zooming. And now you have the modifier keys of your keyboard, like shift. So if I press shift, the left mouse button suddenly turns into zooming. The right mouse button is nothing. Middle also zooms. And if I press control, I can tilt earth in that axis. And if I've maneuvered myself into a mess, I can always use these coordinate systems here on the top. Just say I want to look from above or from below. And then I can use reset to zoom in a bit more. So that gets you back to the normal view. Um, if you don't have the CDI reader, you might have to load the CDI reader plugin. It's described in here in the first step. Um, has, has anybody reached this point? Okay. So in principle, it's possible. Good. So now we have these currents, but we have them as separate variables for u and v. And what we really want to see is the total speed. So what we do is we create a calculator. And we say the result is going to be speed. And the speed is the square root of u times u plus v times And we'll click apply. And suddenly we'll get a picture of speed. Now, the next thing is that the color bar is diverging, which doesn't really make sense for speed. So we'll choose a new color bar. Well, I'll give you a second for doing this first. So for getting a different color bar, uh, go view and you activate the color map editor. I'll just do... And then you can click on this thing with a heart, choose preset. And at first sight, it looks like there's pretty much nothing but this is because it only shows some defaults. So you can also say all, and you get a whole lot of them. And we want something that starts on BL. So BL is all those that have blue in various versions. Which one did I choose? Let me just be. BU. BU GN is blue green. And we use that. Say close. And we'll get this nice image of the ocean currents.
Um, if the net CDF file is not there, you probably didn't run make in the session two directory. Um, so now we have the ocean currents. We can make them a bit brighter um, by rescaling the color map. So we say rescale to custom range. It has a little C, which is hardly readable, but we say anything up to one meter per second is a good ocean current and it becomes a bit brighter. And now there's the light kit thing. So ParaView is built for 3D and what I'm currently doing is abusing it. So I'm only doing a 2D map with a 3D graphics program. And if you want to have a three dimensional thing, you kind of need light and shadow. So that's what ParaView does, but that comes at the cost of brightness. And as we're only doing 2D, we can deactivate the light kit. So we go to the light inspector. And for me, it pops up here on the side. And with the light kit on, it's all a bit darker. With the light kit switched off, it's a bit brighter. And if you have the light kit on, you can play with it. So you have a key light, which is like your main light, it has a warmth, so it can increase it, warmth, or it can decrease it, and things become bluish. So I think it was at 0 0.6. And then I have a fill light with a ratio between key light and fill light. So the fill light is pretty dark right now. And if I decrease this ratio, or if you let me decrease that ratio, doesn't. Okay. Here we go. The fill light becomes brighter. Can't really see it here. The thing you want to do for the Funky colors is just deactivated completely. It becomes really important in 3D. Um, I'll show that in a minute. And other things we can do, we can get a picture in the background to fill the holes in the ocean. So now the thing we want to do is first put a plane behind the picture and then put so we put a plane behind our display and then we put the picture onto that plane. And to put the plane there, we first need to know the size of the plane that we need. So we go on information. So it's you information if you don't have the information window. And we figure out that the size of our picture of the size of our data set is minus 300 to plus 300. And the X range and minus 100 something to 150 in the Y range. So our plane needs to be 300 to negative to positive 300 and negative 150 to positive 150. You go sources, geometric shapes, plane, go back to the properties. And uh, so we replace every 0 0.5 by 300 for the X direction and the 150 for the Y direction. And we're careful to keep the signs in place where they are. And we put it to a Z value of neg negative one. So it's all X, Y, Z. So the whole thing is a bit behind the other stuff. So you apply, and we have a white earth behind our photo of the data. Mm, once you have that, and use sources, the filters, just go search, you say texture. 
back to play. Yes, and then search for text. Keep Okay, so that's the basic moves. You figure out how big your thing is, you put a plane behind it, you give it the exact size of your data, put it behind the data, and then you use a filter. So Paraview has sources and filters, and the filter is called texture map to plane, but you can just search for texture. And in each of these menus, you always have a search box on the top, and that gets you to the properties that you're looking for faster. Okay, just put it in the chat if you have the texture on the image, if anybody has that, and we can see where people are. So there's basically some Paraview kind of thinking. Paraview has sources, which are like objects. And then there are filters that add properties to these objects. So in the pipeline browser here, we see there's the main pipe and UV is the first source object, which is our file. and Plane one's the second source object, which is this plane that we've put in. And to each of these sources, we can connect basically any number of filters. So at some point, Nicholas was doing an image, and this whole pipeline went like two of our screens because he had added so many sources and filters and things at the same time for some really fancy visualization. So you, there's no practical limit to how much you put there. But that's the basic distinction between a source, some more or less 3D object, and a filter, which just adds properties to this object. But it will always stay in the geometrical shape of this object. Texture map to plane is grayed out. You probably have to select the plane. So you first have to do source, geometric shapes, plane. Say so yes, apply just to get it somewhere, and then you can get the filters. Search texture map to plane. Then you can load the texture. And now I haven't seen scale the plane, so it's really small. It's there. Can't zoom in on it. Here it is. So when you add a filter, it will always be added to the object that's currently marked in your pipeline. You need to have a, pretty much anything marked there, and you can add a texture to it. 
just if I take the plane, I can also change the input. So I can say this plane is now something that's attached to the calculator. And then I have the holes in that plane where there's land. So that's pretty pointless. That's why I've created the extra plane. I said before the pair of you is a 3D program, and we can make this very clear by putting the plane a bit further in, into the back. Um, that's 100. And and apply. And now we see that I've been playing with this for too long. Um, the standard projection, the standard view of parallel view is actually a 3D view. So if you do this and you move this plane further and further back, um, and it's 1000, they apply, you will see that there's like, it's drawn much smaller due to perspective. And of course, you get a mismatch between the holes here for the continents and the picture behind it. And you can solve that problem by going here for parallel, saying camera parallel projection, and everything looks nice again. Um, and that's, again, something you don't want to do when you use ParaView as a 3D tool, because then you actually need the perspective. But if you use it as a 2D tool for just creating maps and videos, it's pretty useful because it eliminates these mismatches between um, different layers. Let's see, what else did I then? Um, so now we still have a gray background. And we might not find that very fancy. So we can select basically anything on the pipeline, just go back in the search field, and we find background. And we can choose between gradient, an image, sky box, or a single color. And you could just say single color, some fancy pink. And now it starts to hurt the eye. Um, but you can search for holes in your data with this. Do something neutral. Let's say we want to use it for print later, so we'll just choose a white background, which of course makes our color scale useless, so we'll do a black background. Um, the other background, the other option is we say we really want a white background because we really want to print this. We say white, and now we have to modify our color bar here. And we do this by going to edit color map. No, we don't. We do this by selecting our calculator again, because the color bar is something that belongs to the current speeds. So if we have different variables, they have different color bars. And now I want to change the color bar of the current speeds, which come from the calculator. So I go there. I go to my color map editor. So if you don't have it, it's view color map editor. And then there's another edit thingy in the top right corner of the color legend. 
And here, for example, I can say, yes, Arial is a fine font, but I want this to be black. So I can use it for print. I say, OK. And suddenly it's black. And if I zoom out a little bit, I can just take that bar, drag it over, put it next to the picture. And now I could use this as something that I can export and use later. So I can either say file, um, save screenshot, and I can call it speeds, or PNG. And I can say I want a really, really high resolution. So I do 3000 by 2000. Um, and just say, OK. And then we'll see what happens. Some random errors of OpenGL. EOG opens things here, speeds. And you get this picture, and you can zoom in a bit more. And if you really zoom in, you can actually Maybe. Now oh, you can't really see the little triangles of the data set. You get this high res picture. Um, the other thing that you really want to do when you're working with Paraview is saving states. So Paraview distinguishes between your data and the state. With and it's like cooking you where your data is your ingredients and your state is your recipe. So you want to save the recipe for getting to this point, session two, and we'll call it white background. And you can save as Paraview state file, and we can also save as a Python file. Now that Python version is always a bit dodgy, so save a state file first, and then save a Python file if you're interested. Um, so we say wide background. And any modified and skip hidden is good. Now we actually get a Python script that you can run with PV batch. So you could do batch. white background.py and it would run. That PV batch is part of Paraview. It's a special Python that has Paraview bindings. Um, we have a bit of instruction on that on our web page. Um, I'll post a link in a minute. And just keep keep saving states, keep saving them to different files or use a version control system or whatever you feel like. Um, Paraview. It has become a lot more stable than it was before, but it still sometimes decides to leave your computer very fast, and it's good to have a state file at that point. Um, so keep keep saving. Which actually brings me to one point. Uh, so in the settings, there is um, something some options where you can say you want to save a state on exiting Paraview and you want it to try to save a state when it is crashing. Just activate them. In my early Paraview days, I've had it so many times that I accidentally closed Paraview and all my work of the last hour was gone. So these two options can save a lot of time and with them activated, you will have to say, yes, I want to really close Paraview a couple of times, but that's OK. It's much less hassle. Um, oh, saving animations. So you can also do is save the whole thing as a video. So we have 10 time slices in this file. So here's a time control. I'll zoom in a bit because it's actually not changing that much. 
So if I press play here in the time control, you can see that things are moving a bit in the image. And we can save that as an animation by going File, Save Animation. And the default is to just do PNG images. So we'll say, we'll do speeds any. And then Paraview will suggest to just use the screen size you have, and it will always add a couple digits. So I'll just say yes. And Paraview will save. Again, it's a very good idea to save your state before you export an animation. Um, for two reasons. One is sometimes that actually takes like a day and halfway you figure that something's wrong and sometimes it's just fastest to kill power view and restart from the point where you were before. Or like a week later, your supervisor is like, yeah, I like this picture, but I'd like this detail to be different in the video. And you're like, yeah, sure, I'll just redo it. Um, and then it's really good to have that state file. Or you can just load a completely different simulation that's matching and do the same visualization again, which is also very handy. So now in the session two directory, we have a whole bunch of files. So I do EOG speeds any star. And I can flick through them in EOG. And if you have a MPEG or something, you can actually create videos. Um, so it's not in this virtual machine, but um, if you install it on your local computer, you can install a video codec and you can run create videos. So file. <laughs> File, save state, and then in the, no, that's load state. File, save state. There's a drop down. We basically have two things we can do now. Um, one is, actually what I wanted to do is save animation, see if that works here on Linux. Um, session two, and we'll call it clouds. No, it speeds. As an arc file, yeah, whatever. Little things that um, save a lot of hassle when you're working with Paraview. You can, if you want to export a video, so you want to export it, let's say, for a talk with a full HD projector, then you can save you, preview, and 1920 by 1080 FHD. And Paraview says, well, that's more than I have on this window. Um, yeah. This, that's okay, don't even bother asking again. And usually a pair of you will put a little box here, which it doesn't do right now. So I go back to my pink background. Maybe I can see it then. Yeah, so that's actually the part that's gonna be exported. So now I can arrange everything. 
and my video is going to be here. Bigger. Halaf bar is going here. And if a logo file, save animation. It's two. Um, it already knows that I'm going to do 1920 by 1080. And it can say OK. And it will save that animation. So if I open that thing now, it's two has exactly the size that I want it to be, and everything is in the places where I want the things to be. Now, I'm still a bit bothered by this lovely coordinate system here. That's in the bottom corner of my screen. And I can just deactivate it here in the top menu. There's basically two things we can do now. We can either move on and um, add clouds to this thing, or we can have a little look at the Python. Two people want Python. Okay. File, save state. Save it as a Python file of the pink background. and have a brief look at it. It starts with a bit of comment, then it creates its render view, and some layouts, puts the plane in place. So one of the most interesting things here is um, this UV and C, it's taken from the name here. So you could rename it here to get a nicer name here, but UV and C is actually pretty okay. And then it says CDI reader, file names, and this list of one file. And that's a great place where you can insert any other list of files. So you could use system to, or some other, tool of your choice to get command line arguments to end up here, or you can use glob or whatever. And then it has the dimensions, the variables, a layer thickness, which becomes relevant once you do 3D things. It does this color map as this weird or long list of points, but you can also tell it to use a string and I can let me look for that later. And then it does the display and texture map to plane display. So every object has a display. So this is the display of the calculator. And that's the display of the texture map to plane with the background photo. So here it creates a texture from the file where you could change that file name. And probably somewhere says that it's going to use world again, world two.
the one thing that I usually do is so it says set active source none here at the end. And I usually take the UV, the NetCDF file. And now I can save a screenshot from this. And the best way to figure out Python commands for doing things in Paraview is actually just to ask Paraview for it. So you can go to tools and you say start trace at the bottom of tools. And so you say start trace, you say show incremental trace, and you modify it properties, you say okay. And Paraview you will start telling you what you've been doing. So for example, if I choose a different background color, I get a trace. And this one is actually pretty long, but at the bottom it says render view background is zip. So this is the Python thing I need to change my background color. And I'll just leave this here and I say file, save screenshot. Use a couple of characters, say yes. I'll look at my script editor again. And now I know how to save a screenshot. I can copy this. And I can paste it there. Well, if I could copy and paste. There we go. The same way I can advance a time step. Look at the thing. And I see go to first, go to next. Okay, that's copying. And now, of course, I could build a loop, and I've done that before, so I know that there's a different way of doing this. I'll just fetch it from my scripts. Now this actually is an array of the time step variables. You can do something like print what time steps I have. And then I can say, I can iterate over these time steps. And I can modify this save command. And this should be a script that saves all the time steps, if I manage to indent correctly. So these can go. And I'll, I'll provide the script later. So we save, and we say, if you batch, pink background, and it's going to crash, most likely. Mm. 
because it doesn't know where the CGI reader is. So we have to go back to the tools, manage plugins, CDI reader. It's loaded for Paraview, but that doesn't mean it's loaded for PV batch for some weird reason. So it's up Paraview bin, no, up Paraview lib, Paraview plugins, CDI reader, CDI reader. And can load it with a simple load command in the start. So we go to the top of the script. That's something you don't have to do when you're using ours. Well, most of our standard power views on this trial. Um, this is, so that's the load command, we just have to change the path of the file. So let's opt pair of view lib yeah. pair of view again. Plugins CDI reader, CDI reader so oh, that's the path we need. Save. Background. I don't know this one actually. So sometimes you have different plugins in the in the GUI power view than in the PV batch and mismatches between these plugins cause trouble. So somehow it feels like it should run our spray and we'll just get rid of this. See if that helps. map to plane osprey scale function piecewise function on okay so we'll have to fight the texture map to plane thing we could probably also search for an osprey plug in I think I activated it. Try again. Yeah, that looks much better. These ones I know. Views, view to turn. It's G, so I haven't. Copy the full stuff, that's okay. Hmm, I have to get the view, okay. View is get active view. Ta-da! 
And now we have these files here. So I will upload the Python script to the GitLab repository. And this is the basic thing. So basically you only need this bit under normal conditions as an add-on on your Python script that you get from the state file. Depending on your Paraview installation, you need the loading the plugin. And sometimes there's some feature. So I think it's probably a plugin thing with the um, Osprey. I'm not 100% sure. Um, I haven't had that error on my laptop or on Mistral on our computer. So, um, but usually it's one of these, and then you just remove lines that you don't need. And that's basically all you need to run Paraview as a Python script. So this is something you can include. Well, you can basically include it in your job processing chain by just switching the the load statement and the start. So change the file names thingy, and you can run this on any data set of your liking. And one thing that I've started doing is, um, so for this example, we've used R2B6 data, so that's what, nine is five kilometers, eight is 10, 20, 40 kilometer data, which easily fits into my laptop. I can play with that very easily, and then I can just switch the file names for a high resolution data set where all this interactive stuff is no fun at all. And I can just run the same script again over any amount of high resolution data in jobs on the supercomputer. So that's why I really love this Python option. That's it from my side. Any questions, comments, whatever? Those that did or did not use um, the, the virtual machine, we would definitely appreciate any feedback now on whether this is useful for you, what you like, what you didn't like, what you need different. Because we still have more of these um, workshops coming up and we need your input to make them efficient for you. So, you really need to use the PV batch Python, or there's also a PV Python for interactive use if you want to use Paraview in Python. So you don't use your standard Python, but you use the Python that's provided with Paraview. And you can compile your own Paraview with your own, your own Python of your choice. Um, compiling Paraview isn't very tricky, but it will keep your computer busy for quite a while. I have a pretty powerful laptop and it's ours to compile a pair of you. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, so it's PB batch or PV Python for interactive use. And also if you if you're really desperate, you can start a Python shell in Paraview, but I've found it's very unwieldy. So sometimes I do it. I think it's in view Python shell. Uh, but it doesn't really know about the things in there and uh, the, the key bindings are a bit weird. Not very handy, but sometimes it's good to use. Um, so next week, Donatello will be picking up again. We have the whole program on the Easy Waste web page. So session three on the 22nd of October on the Thursday. So it's not on the Tuesday again, it's on the Thursday, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Ophelia Advanced Concepts.